All righty. We'll make a start. Welcome, everybody. There'll be a few people uh, still joining us, I dare say, but to those of you who are already here, uh, welcome to the event. Um, my name's Stephen Young. I'm an Associate Professor of Geography and International Studies here at UW-Madison. And I am also the Faculty Director of the Institute for Regional International Studies National Resource Center or IRIS NRC. And uh, that is the main uh, center that is uh, bringing you this uh, event today. Uh, we are a center that tries to uh, support and enhance global awareness and uh, um, inspire informed thinking about the complexities of our world um, and to do so in a way that uh, engages not just people on campus, but off campus, community college educators, K-12 educators, and the uh, community at large. If you go to our website, irisnrc.com, you will find lots of resources to do with questions of migration, of uh, refugees, of inequality and poverty, of gender, and of um, uh, women's health. Uh, so do please check out some of those uh, resources. We also want to thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the Department of African Cultural Studies, uh, and please do also uh, check out their website um, uh, to see more about the kinds of work that they do. Today's event, well, there's a World Cup coming up. I think most of you um, uh, who are here probably know that already, um, but we thought at Iris NRC that it would be great to mark that event with um, a few events of our own to get people uh, prepared to watch, not just what's happening on the field, but the sort of broader um, social field in which uh, soccer is, is now embedded. So this will be the first in a series of three events. We have another event, um, a film club next uh, Wednesday, looking at questions around workers and human rights in, in Qatar. Of course, the immigrant workers who did much of the work of building the infrastructure and stadiums. And then the following Monday, we'll have an event with Peter Alleghi, who is a professor of history at uh, Michigan State University, uh, has done a lot of research about uh, and writing about soccer, particularly from the vantage point of Africa and its own position um, in, in relation to global soccer. Um, and we hope that you'll join us for, for those two event, events as well. Um, this particular event, though, will be with um, uh, Professor Vlad Dima, and we'll be uh, talking in particular about a book, uh, a novel, The Belly of the Atlantic, and, and thinking about what that illuminates about soccer and its meanings uh, in the, the wider world that we live in today. Uh, before we get started and before I introduce our speaker, I just want to read out the UW-Madison land, land Acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has, has called the Joe since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the whole Trump nation, along with 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. So our speaker today is Vlad Dima. Uh, he is professor and chair of the Department of African Cultural Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has published numerous articles, uh, mainly on French and fran Francophone cinema, literature, uh, comics, and television. He is the author of the following book, um, Sonic Space in Debril Diop Bambetti's films. Uh, he also published a book that is uh, uh, relevant to the, uh, in particular to the conversation we'll be having today entitled The Beautiful Skin, Football, Fantasy, and Cinematic Bodies in Africa. Uh, and most recently, he published Meaninglessness, Time, Rhythm, and the Undead in Postcolonial Cinema. Um, Vlad, I, I know, also is teaching a course this semester, uh, a, a big a freshman interest group uh, with first years at our, our campus, uh, related to football and related to uh, Africa's um, uh, relationship with global soccer. Um, and I know from a prior conversation with him that uh, some of the, the books and, and, and films that he has worked with, and one in particular was um, in, of interest to me, The Belly of the Atlantic, and that's what I invited him to come and talk about today. Um, some of you who registered early will be receiving a free copy of that book as well, and so hopefully this talk will give you 
um, some, some more motivation to read it and some things to be thinking about as you do. So uh, I'm excited to hear about what the book means to you, Vlad. So I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Stephen. So thank you for the introduction and for uh, thank you for inviting me and thinking the, about uh, you know, putting this event together. Thank you to SE for dealing with the logistics. Um, I am currently in my office in Van Huys, and I just realized that as chair of my department, somebody might knock on my door. So hopefully that doesn't happen. I apologize in advance. Um, um, this is normally my safe space, but not, not since I've been chair. Um, all right, so I thought about how to approach this book today for this talk. Um, and um, we're gonna do, or what I'd like to do is um, tackle the book on, or the, the talk and split it in two major parts. One being basically my academic approach to the study of this book, uh, what made it into, uh, uh, the beautiful skin that that the second book that uh, Stephen mentioned in the introduction, and then um, after that move into how I actually teach it and what I do with it in class. I I just uh, we just wrapped uh, a discussion on uh, the belly of the Atlantic in my thick course. I have 17 first year students uh, in that particular class. Um, it is also, I mean, I immediately accepted the invitation because a novel that's uh, meaningful to me uh, uh, and the story is meaningful to me as, a, as an immigrant in this country, uh, uh, this novel being about uh, uh, an immigrant to France from, from, from Senegal. Um, but as Stephen's presentation um, introduction rather um, expressed, I'm, I'm more of a film scholar. So it's interesting that I am starting this series uh, with uh, discussing a literary text, which is uh, uh, not so much my area of expertise, but I, I think I will uh, do a decent job today. I'll, I'll aim to do a decent job today. So, um, I'll start the first part, which is uh, I've used this text, this uh, novel as a literary example in my book in terms of representations of soccer or football in uh, West African uh, Francophone texts. So again, I mostly focus on cinema and I'll mention uh, today a few titles for you to uh, think about or uh, watch uh, perhaps uh, after, this, uh, after this talk. But um, I also wanted to uh, address uh, uh, the representation of soccer that's kind of unique uh, that occurs in this particular novel. So in order to situate you, because I'm gonna read now and then I'll go into when I talk about the uh, my, my, uh, my, my teaching approach, I will go into a more sort of um, loose, I guess, format by reading off my notes. Uh, but I, I do want to read some snippets from The Beautiful Skin. So in order for you to sort of understand where I'm coming from, the, the five pages from the book that deal with the novel, I wanted to just to briefly uh, read the abstract of the book itself uh, so you kind of know what I'm driving at. Uh, in terms of the overall message of, of, of that particular book. So the title is again, uh, The Beautiful Skin, Football Fantasy and Cinematic Bodies in Africa. Uh, the initial title was Fantasy, Football and Cinematic Bodies, one chapter for fantasy, one for football, one for the body of cinema, but the press somehow thought that people will be thinking that I mean fantasy football as in, you know, the the, I actually never played it, but I, I think you know what fantasy football is. You pick uh, NFL players and you know, <laughs> and you have leagues. That was not this. So this was published in 2020 by Michigan State University Press. It investigates how football and cinema express individual and collective fantasies in Africa and highlights where the two, football and cinema, so literature is not even in there, converge and diverge with regard to neocolonial fantasies. Yet whose fantasy do football and African cinema articulate? The possible answers to this question are necessarily connected to issues of body and identity, which are explored through the metaphor of skin. Part one, the beautiful fantasy, looks at fantasy as a type of skin. Part two, the beautiful game, considers the possibility of football jerseys as a type of skin. And finally, part three, the beautiful, uh, the beautiful skin splits the body in three as visual, oral, and haptic in order to posit that film itself has a skin and is therefore corporeal. The neocolonial body is often depicted as suffering and in the process of being flattened or emptied. 
African cinema, diasporic cinema, and a few literary examples as well, Valley of the Atlantic being one of them. So frequently replicate this hollowed body, all skin as it were, that it becomes the form that defines neocolonialism. So that's basically the general direction of the book, right? So I'm gonna dive in uh, the portion that deals with uh, Belly of the Atlantic. The subtitle here is Football in uh, the Belly of the Atlantic. And it's just about uh, five pages. Um, and this, uh, it's on page 40 of my book. So it's, uh, I'm already, you know, sort of in, into my, um, already way into my argument by, by this point. Football in the belly of the Atlantic. Uh, representations of football are not reserved solely for African cinema, of course. Fatou Diom's brilliant novel, Le Ventre de l'Atlantique, The Belly of the Atlantic from 2003, first translated into English in 2006, puts forth the most sustained literary effort to engage with the impact of football in the life of Africans and migrant Africans. Diom is a Senegalese French writer whose main narrative focus has been immigration. She has had a steady output of novels, Ketala, 2006, Ina Suvino V, Our Unfulfilled Lives from 2008, Celle qui attend, Women Who Wait, 2010, and Impossible to Grandir, Impossible to Grow Up from 2013. In 2017, she ventured into nonfiction with the publication of Marianne Portplante, Identité Nationale, des Passerelles, Pas des Barrières. Marianne complains, national identity bridges, not barriers. As the long title suggests, Guillaume argues for a rethinking of the national, French national identity and pushes for multiculturalism. In using the most important French symbol, la Marianne, the personification of freedom and reason, followed by an active verb, complaints, Guillaume echoes Emile Zola's letter, j'accuse, but with a crucial twist. If in the case of Zola's attack on anti-Semitism, the anger was an outward movement from the individual toward the state, for Diom, it is the state that must look inward and change its ways. Diom has also been a very vociferous presence in the media. Her comments on the lack of attention paid to the tra tragedies of migration, such as migrant boat capsizing, due to the fact that their victims are not white, went viral in 2013. In spite of her varied portfolio, it is the first novel, The Belly of the Atlantic, that remains her most popular and influential work. In this novel, Diom uh, studies the effects of immigration both on the person who left the country, Senegal, and on those who stayed behind. Her main character, Sally, lives in France, while back home on the island of New York, her younger brother, Madike, waits for her to bring him to Europe too. He loves football, especially the Italian star, superstar rather, Paolo Maldini, and dreams of playing in Europe himself. The novel alternates skillfully between Senegal and France in order to expose both the grim lived experience of the immigrant and the fantasy projection of the immigrant hopeful. The plot moves forward thanks to several phone conversations between brother and sister, which provoke various memories for the latter that are to be shared with the reader. The eventual open ending is necessary because the subject matter is such that it makes resolutions impossible. Yet in the denouement, the young brother has a change of heart and tells his sister to come back home because, and I quote, you'll never really be at home there, you know that, end quote. In response to her brother's suddenly mature assessment of life, Sally wonders rhetorically, and I quote, home over there, end quote, and then proceeds to muse on her, on her exile and broken identity, and I quote again, a permanent exile, I spend my nights soldering the rails that lead to identity. I seek my country where the fragmentation of identity blurs, end quote. Whether she could possibly ever find it country where identity remains a mystery. Putting questions of identity aside for a moment, the novel thrust itself, itself into the world of football from the beginning. On the first page, the reader finds Sally watching Maldini on TV. It is her way of connecting with her brother across continents, though she the shared experience through the shared experience of watching football. It is such an intense uh, experience, so fully is she immersed in the game that it seeps into her real life, quote unquote, real life. And I use the scare quotes uh, because she remains a fictional character after all; she is not real. And I quote here: uh, "In front of the TV, I leap off the sofa and give a violent kick. Ouch! The table. I wanted to run with the ball." End quote. Here, Diom constructs two levels of representation for football on TV and in the novel that crucially mix together in the mind of the narrator. Interestingly, Sally, the narrator, also compares the power of the game to that of the cinema. 
uh, it, and I quote, commands as big an audience as a cinema screen, end quote. The football fantasy on screen takes over her body literally, causing her to kick invisible balls. The connection she has with her brother carries over in terms of the physical reactions too, and I quote. At Maldini's first tackle, his foot spontaneously strikes the bum of the boy squatting in front of him, hoofing him up in the air, end quote. The game seems to control both bodies across continents and airwaves. The experience of the emotional roller coaster that is watching the game of football on TV becomes an apt analogy for the immigrant experience in France. Just as the game takes over the body, the immigrant often feels that he or she lives someone else's life and finds himself or herself through transference in places the immigrant cannot control, where the body acts on its own as the subject is stripped of agency. The difficulty of dealing with a space that is not home and could never quite be home is emphasized in the beginning of the novel through the repeated use of the word dream as a noun, as a verb, and its synonyms such as reverie. Moreover, Sally introduces an element of constant doubt about achieving success in a foreign land by repeatedly referring to an imaginary and a phantasmagorical vision. In other words, nothing about Sally's experience feels real. Another element that contributes to the construction of the character's identities is the fact that Madike and Sali are islanders and come from a place that Samuel Zadi calls a synecdoche for post-colonial Africa, and I quote here, where modernism and capitalism are slowly making a home for themselves, end quote. Dion poetically refers to the effects that nature has on her characters, whether real or imagined, reconstructed by memory, and she often uses skin as the conduit. Quote here, the sea breeze, in its mercy, brushed the skin almost imperceptibly, end quote. And another one, the white sand, a whirlwind, flagellating their skin, end quote. The physical references to skin and to the contact it makes with the native land hint at Sally's reaching for a collective identity, as Katrin Mazorek calls it, by way of personal identity. The rhetorical shift occurs in the, uh, occurs in the two given examples through the change to a possessive adjective, in the first instance, the skin encompasses not only the locals, but Sali herself. In the second instance, the skin is given a direct possessive as the narrator removes herself from the equation. This trend continues later in the book when Sali describes the villagers going out to fish on the rough seas, quote, with only their black skin to offer it, end quote. This first mention of skin color, that was page 82 of the novel, this first mention of skin color is relevant because it is found in the context of describing the sea and what can be offered to it. As the title of the novel indicates, the Atlantic and its belly put forth a somber subtext that alludes to the slave trade. Boats have bellies, another name for the hold of the ship, la cale in French. And it is in this very space that slaves were, were carried to the Caribbean. Playing off the material value of quote unquote belly, as well as its connection to motherhood, Guillaume does suggest that the source of contemporary slavery continues to be the Atlantic itself, because the fishermen still give it their own skin, i.e. their bodies. In Notebook of a Return to the Native Land from 1939, Aimé Césaire refers to the hold of the ship too. For him, this is the first place of revolution. Here, and he uses a neologist, uh, uh, well, at least for the time being, Césaire was famous for inventing words, the grai in this, uh, in this particular context is, doesn't have a translation, but that he refers to all the people that were stuck inside the belly of the boats. So he uses this word, the it begins standing up, moving then to the cabins, followed by the deck of the ship, and eventually dispersed into the wind. That was says that now. So, two cinematic examples further underscore the importance of the boat belly. Musa Toure's La Pirogue and Jibril Job Mambeti's Tukibuki. Uh, La Pirogue is 2012 and uh, Mambeti's Tukibuki is 1973. In the first, Torres film, migrants fail to reach the shores of Spain and the bell, belly of the Atlantic ensnares them. In the second, countless young men em embark aboard the Dakar Marseille ship uh, called Anserville, which appears in many, many Senegalese films. While the soundtrack features uh, twisting and twisted noises of a creaking ship, a ship bending under the weight of modern slaves. In the context of the novel, Musa is one such modern slave and Diom and actually, I'm just realizing on that perhaps uh, not everyone has read the novel uh, and you know about the relationship between Madike and Sally. Musa is, uh, is a vignette story of, of a few pages in this, in this novel about a very talented uh, football player who goes over to friends but doesn't make the team and then has 
uh, suddenly uh, this, this debt that he has uh, to, to, to pay back. Um, and he doesn't have papers. Uh, anyway, long story short, he actually has to, is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, caught by the police at one point uh, as he's working on a boat illegally trying to work off this debt and is sent back home uh, where he faces the shame of being, uh, of his failure, I guess. But is, is it really a failure? It's not, it's just, he's just a victim of this, uh, you know, system scouts promising him things. Uh, the debt is actually not to the club, but to the scout who brought him from Senegal into, into France. Uh, so that's Musa. So in the context of the novel, Musa is one such modern slave. Uh, and uh, that's the actual, those are actual words used in the novel to describe his condition. In the context, I already read that. Uh, and Diom uses a reference to, uh, to skin to suggest the violence of his alienation that occurs while he's in France. Quote here, the harshness of winter, the wind biting his skin, the lack of sunlight, end quote. Musa is a classic case of the échoué, uh, failed, the failed, to use Franz Fanon's term. And later in the novel, the narrator connects her own story to Musa's while still channeling Franz Fanon. And I quote here, to leave is to die of absence. You return, of course, but you return a different person, end quote. She may prove an equally failed case. Sally's brother is also in danger of becoming an échoué, a failed person, because of his relentless drive to be someone else. According to Sally's uh, observations about uh, her brother's behavior, he emulates Maldini to such extent that he begins to become Maldini. And I have a longer quote here about this uh, relationship between Madike and Maldini. Because he always attempted to copy the moves and body language of the AC Milan skipper, his friends called him Maldini to tease him. Far from being insulted, he was honored and his whole life revolved around his new identity. From simple fan, he'd been promoted to the level of clone. He only wore Maldini's number and played the same position as him. Maldini's shirts replaced the greater part of his wardrobe. Even off the pitch, you could tell him by his shirt. Sali's commentary on this change in behavior does not necessarily read as positive. Referring to Madike as a clone can certainly be an alarming loss of identity. He is quite like Maldini, but not really. Also important is the promotion, in quotes, from fan to clone. Yet Madike becoming a clone could be fine as long as it happens within the fake confines of the, of the pitch. The more stringent problem, as I understand it and as Sali implies, is the complete transformation that occurs once Madike remains a clone of someone else's off the pitch. The this final metamorphosis spills over into real life, taking away Madike's sense of individuality. The Maldini jersey hollows Madike out. I'll remind you of my, my reading of the abstract that in post-colonial texts, uh, especially in West Africa, a lot of times characters are described as being emptied or flattened. So the Maldini jersey hollows Madike out, i.e. there is no other essence to the character except the one defining him from outside the body. This process leaves him as an empty shell, just skin, and not, a, not even his own skin, which has been replaced by the skin of the jersey, the Maldini jersey. One final word on Maldini and AC Milan. While the defender certainly emblemized the team in the early, mid, in the early to mid 1990s, in the last part of the decade, a prominent African figure would emerge at the club, the, Liger the Li Liberian uh, George Opun Uwea. Mm -hmm. Following an upward trajectory that began with success in the Cameroonian Championship, then in France with AS Monaco, Uwea would win every possible individual award while at the iconic French club Paris Saint-Germain. He would win the African, European, and World Player of the Year awards. In 1995, AC Milan buys him in a multi-million multi dollar transaction, and he would go on to win two championships with the club. If Wea had appeared on the European stage a few years earlier, perhaps Madike would have been obsessed with the jersey and the skin, not as far removed from his own. So then I, I move into uh, questions of fantasy here. So that's basically the interruptions, the academic interruptions that, 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 I, that I use in, in, my, in my book uh, to, dive into representations of, uh, of soccer. So now I will uh, go to the second part of my talk, which is uh, to explain, sorry. I came to the Zoom straight from my fake class and my students were uh, 
uh, not talkative today for some reason. I think it's the nice weather. So I've, I've been speaking for a couple of hours straight. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so I'll go into teaching, uh, into how I teach this novel and what I do with it. And uh, in the process, um, do a little more unpacking uh, of, the, of the novel itself. So basically I have six potential ways to offer you that could prove useful uh, as entry points into this novel. And that's basically what I do with my students. They are first year students, uh, very talented. They write very well, they participate, um, but uh, none of them have had uh, sustained uh, uh, experience either with film studies or literary studies. So the very first thing that I do is simplify uh, sort of the class conversation. And I focus very much so on the narrative, meaning, you know, what happens? Are you guys understanding what happened in the 30 pages that you read for today's class, right? Uh, and the easiest thing for me has, uh, and for them has, seems to be just uh, tracing the relationship, the evolution uh, of the relationship between uh, the half brothers, uh, Madike and Sally, right? And their sort of uh, tribulations and uh, worries uh, for, well, especially from Sally to Madike, and then his big change of heart at the very end, where he becomes sort of the, the, the voice of reason and is trying to entice uh, Sally to come back to uh, Senegal and to the island. So, number one for teaching, follow the narrative and follow the relationship between the half brothers, uh, half siblings, rather. Um, two, follow the major themes. Um, I mean, this is something that I always ask my students early on to identify because uh, it's kind of, it's, it's always tricky to, to figure out what is the major theme. And then, you know, there's some confusion with motifs and things like that. But, uh, you know, what are the, uh, the, the, the large items that, you know, we should consider the large ideas for, for this? And we've come up with four in my class. Um, and this is another way through which one can understand this novel. Uh, identity, memory, migration, alienation. All these four are eminently post-colonial uh, topics uh, and a big part of what I do in this particular class and in general is considering the question of the post-colonial, meaning what is the post-colonial because it constantly shifts and changes and where we are nowadays, at least in my particular field, uh, we have made some progress in terms of expanding the notion of uh, post-colonial or accepting rather than no, that the post-colonial is everywhere, right? It's not just in the ex-colonies, and that used to be the, the thinking you know, 15, 10 years ago even, um, but we can consider uh, the space uh, uh, like the hexagon, right? Like, that, that, like France, it's an eminently post-colonial space for, 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 for various reasons. So the ex-empires uh, are also post-colonial spaces, not just the ex-colonies. Um, one particular quote that uh, we, we uh, underlined in my class and we uh, talked about uh, quite a bit that connects two of these because not only are they all eminently post-colonial, but they're also sort of feeding one into another. So to later, uh, late in the novel, page 162 or so, uh, Sally declares, my memory is my identity. So that's a very clear connecting tissue between uh, who she is and remembering things, right? So uh, memory as a theme connects strongly with the notion of identity. So that's two, narrative, major themes. Three, uh, follow the motifs. There are several motifs. There are several uh, mentions that get repeated of items, ideas. Um, uh, abstract ideas also, but also material things. Um, and uh, that's been a nice way for us to unpack uh, the vignettes, but also the main stories. The major one is soccer. I've already sort of discussed that. Uh, Madike wants to go to France uh, and, and be, a, um, you know, be a soccer player. Uh, but Fatou Diom has this warning shot for us and for him through the story of Musa. Look what might happen if you try to do that. Uh, another important motif, water slash ocean, uh, that connects to the title as well. And it's a place of birth, but it's also a place of death. It's a very sort of paradoxical uh, uh, space that surrounds the island of Nio Dior, of course. And it's a transitional place, uh, space, and it, there are all these 
qualities uh, that are uh, uh, fabulous to sort of think about in, in terms of the post-colonial through water, through the ocean. The island, right? So the, the identity of the characters as, as, as islanders, somewhat being, being somewhat removed from even the country itself and the continent, right? So they're not technically in the body of, uh, the, of Senegal or in the body of the African continent. They're a little bit separated. So there is a second degree of foreignness uh, to islanders. And we have the character of Mdetare, the, the, the teacher who is a Marxist and has been uh, uh, exiled on this island from, from, the, from the main body of, uh, of Senegal. Um, dreams and fantasy, another motif. This fits very well into sort of the European fantasy of El Dorado. Uh, polygamy appears uh, quite a bit. Um, now, religion itself can be a theme, and, it, and it's, it's less so a theme, I believe, in this novel, and more so of a motif that just gets mentioned. Uh, if you think of a novel like Maria Mabaz, um, um, uh, So Long a Letter, that's, that's religion becomes more it's, it's foregrounded a little more. Uh, the motif of the boat, which I discussed in my reading of the hold that connects to slavery, connects with the transatlantic uh, slave trade, connects to ideas of motherhood, uh, but also death. Uh, and then finally, the belly of the Atlantic from the title that sort of brings everything together. And we have several mentions in this novel of this, this belly, right? What is this belly? Is it really a place of birth? We have, you know, uh, and again, it could be taken as a positive or as a negative. Uh, Guillaume does a fantastic job sort of uh, painting, um, I, I, I guess, not, not playing favorites or showing us all the options and always sort of like being neutral in terms of <laughs> uh, what is a positive and what is a negative, kind of falling down the middle. Uh, but anyway page in the title 47, 75, 81, 87, 90, 91, 134. It's, it's all over the place, references to the belly of the Atlantic. Sorry. So we're up at uh, two, three, uh, number four. Follow the intertextuality uh, in this novel. Uh, this is an opportunity for, uh, for me to teach my students about many other texts, uh, especially African texts uh, from all over the continent, but especially West uh, Francophone West African. Um, and also some European mentions. Uh, importantly, the mentions of African texts, of Senegalese novels and movies and uh, uh, artists uh, is basically doubles the references of uh, French slash European culture. Uh, and I believe that's uh, on purpose, uh, of course, uh, to foreground the uh, output, the artistic output, the cultural output of uh, Africans on the global stage. Uh, alongside that idea that the post-colonial is everywhere, another thing that we do in my class, in my classes in general, is try to sort of understand or uh, realize, accept, however you want to put it, uh, or at least at the very least become aware of the fact that culture certainly moves from the global south to the global north, and it's not always in that hierarchical way that has led to racism, has led to colonialism itself uh, of us versus them and things like that. So, how does I, you know, Fatou Diom's novel is one such example actually where uh, uh, culture moves uh, from global south from Africa into European spaces. And influences them and changes them. It's not it's not a one way street, uh, and that is important to identify in at least the very least in my in my field. So intertextuality is references obviously to other texts within the current text that you're reading. Um, and I've already mentioned Mariama Ba, but Mariama Ba, so long a letter uh, from 1979. Uh, uh, classic, classic feminist novel uh, in Senegalese uh, literature and world literature uh, really gets uh, named a couple of times uh, directly in this, in this novel, in Fatou Guillaume's novel. There is a point on page 42 where in italics, there's a reference to an ambiguous adventure that comes from L'Aventure Ambiguë. That's the title, the very title of a, a different Senegalese novel from 1961 by Sheikh uh, Hamidou Kane. Uh, another important uh, novel in the history of African uh, literary studies. Several uh, references to a gelois. This is a Senegal, this is a wolf term that means uh, noble warrior. And Sally uses, uh, sometimes she'll add female uh, um, gelois because technically gelois refers to a man, but so she changes the gender there. 
Uh, that happens to be the title of a Wisman Semben film from 1992, in Kenoir, uh, that features actually, interestingly, a, a man who's already dead. So it features a, a voice from, uh, from, from, from the beyond. And we see sort of in flashback, but who's flashback, uh, how he, he came to die. It's a fantastic film. Um, a lot of references to Senghor, Leopold Sedar Senghor, first president of the Republic, uh, also one of the forefathers of the Negritude movement, along with M.S. Cesar and Leon Damas. Senghor is a um, complicated figure, to say the least, um, uh, but references to him in this novel, you can trace them by looking at any anything that has to do with rhythm, right? So he, he had this thing about rhythm and Negritude. And connecting with the universe, how the black soul connects through the to, with the universe through through our rhythm, meaning the Senegalese rhythm. Um, and the reason why it, it's it's complicated with Senghor is that he has a, a you know, major contribution to uh, Senegalese culture, to the movement of negritude. But he was also very much so a francophile, and he was. Uh, uh, he loved all things French and he imposed the French language in, in classes. He also had some unfortunate expression in terms of like sort of presenting dichotomies like on this side of, of, of Africa, of Senegal, we have rhythm and intuition and on the side of Europe, we have reason, right? So that you, you might hear in those, in that dichotomy, unfortunately, uh, things that uh, empires have used for, for centuries to sort of present themselves as better as, you know, the mission civilatrice in France, from France to, to Senegal and all those things. So Senghor, Complicated figure, complex figure, but uh, gets referenced uh, quite a bit uh, through the notions of rhythm. Uh, the use of the verb partir, to leave, uh, which I quoted before myself, that comes from a message also, uh, from Cahier dans le Tour pays natal, notebook of uh, Return to the uh, Motherland, um, 41 and 162 are two references that I found. And references to wretched, uh, the use of this adjective uh, is a direct, intertextual reference to Wretched of the Earth, 1961 by Franz Fanon, one of his two major, major uh, works. So that's the African slash uh, Caribbean, uh, so not just African uh, uh, intertextual references. And then we have a few European ones over there, which I quoted before when she's wondering, do I wanna go over there? But over there, generally, it should be, is, is the other way around from, from, Fran from Senegal to France, but she's thinking about back to Neodor becomes over there. And in that case, uh, that's a direct sort of quote from uh, uh, Charles Baudelaire, the, the famous uh, symbolist poet, 19th century in France, who changed basically the way we, we consider uh, ugliness. Uh, you know, uh, he, he looked at to create beauty out of uh, vampires, drunk words, prostitutes, disease, all those things. Uh, but it's a famous expression from one of his poems, Laba, over there, meaning in an exotic place. So interestingly, Sully uses Baudelaire's words that usually refer to something exotic and sort of like an unknown destination to refer to her own island. There is a reference to Simone de Beauvoir, uh, the uh, mother of feminism really, uh, and a direct reference to, uh, not to her, she gets named um, writer of the second sex and that connects, the book is called Second Sex. Uh, that connects to Mariama, Mariama Ba's um, uh, so long a letter. And we have a couple of references to Godot, uh, Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. Beckett wrote both in uh, English and in French, but you know the stuff he wrote in French, he didn't translate directly from English, kind of rewrote it. Uh, so anyway, the references are about uh, the, the famous play Vladimir and Estragon waiting for Godot who never shows up. So that's a metaphor for uh, the post-colonial condition. You know, we're still waiting to see what will happen. How are we getting to a place that's actually good for uh, everyone involved? So that's D. Kind of running out of time. I thought I was going to stop at uh, 20 minutes. So I'll just go a couple more minutes very quickly. Uh, so um, I guess I lied. It's, uh, it's five, it's not six, because I just look at my notes and I jump from D to F. So E would be following cultural ideas, symbols, material artifacts represented in the novel as another way to sort of enter this novel. Some of the cultural, cultural ideas, Teranga, the notion of hospitality, Senegalese hospitality. The Senegalese national team is called Lions of Teranga because of this. 
uh, jonge, which is the practice of enticing one's husband. Um, um, so it's, it goes for teranga is public while, ter, while jonge is uh, private. And there's references to both of those in, in the novel. So enticing one's husband, not just necessarily sexually, but certainly sexually, like by cooking him certain things and whatnot. Speaking of that, lots of references to yasa and chebujen, those are traditional uh, Senegalese dishes. References to wrestling, which is actually happens to be the king sport in Senegal, although football. Um, references to the ataya, which is the tea ceremony. Those are peppered throughout, uh, throughout the book. Um, so it's always fun to, uh, you know, show my students these videos of, of people in the streets making tea and then pouring it from six feet up you know into like these tiny cups uh, as a way to filter them and you know and air them out uh, and finally the palaver tree which gets referenced quite a bit this is a mythical place of uh, for you know for a meeting of sorts and but we have actual trees referred that we refer to in this novel the baobab trees which are, are not a symbol of Senegal so in closing World inequalities are highlighted in this novel, but Guillaume does not seem to pass judgment on the people who have chosen the European fantasy. All options are on the table. She advises Madike to stay, but also realizes that she doesn't want to impose something on him, which would represent a continuation of the colonial behaviors. This is a dark novel at times, but is also extremely hopeful, showing how a young man can achieve success on his island with the help of his half-sister and without football and showing that a young immigrant woman can also achieve success in the adopted country. She is a famous, a successful writer after all. However, the question remains, a question that all immigrants might struggle with, at what cost? So I am gonna end very abruptly on that rhetorical question and I, I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vlad. That was uh, really wonderful. Um, both the, the sort of more scholarly kind of reading of the text and how it fits in with your larger book projects, but also helping us to think about how we're, you know non-experts, including myself, might uh, teach this book as well. And um, if people have questions, you can raise your hand, um, or you can post into the chat box, I believe, and we can uh, take the, the um, questions that way. So uh, please do raise your hand if you have a question to ask. Um, maybe though, since I'm, I'm moderating, I'll ask the first one um, while people are thinking of their own, uh, which is to say that one of the things about the novel is that thinking about it in the, in the context of you know, being published 20 years ago is, is that how prescient it is to sort of use these sort of aspirations around around soccer and the story of Musa as someone who is sort of scouted and then recruited, but you know, having never made it, left you know indebted as a consequence of this. I mean, in the in the ensuing twenty years, those the European football has become more dominated, and particularly as a sort of media spectacle in in, in many parts of Africa. African immigration of African players into European leagues has has intensified, and this parallel problem of people being recruited in all of you know um these nefarious ways um uh, by this sort of shadow scouting system um and and, and the terrible things stories that have come out have, have also been highlighted as well and i'm wondering you talked a little bit about intertextuality with the the novel and, and the way that it um draws on and, and references other um um literary and, and cinematic uh, works and, and figures do you have a sense of how the novel itself may be, given that it speaks to a, a problem, you know, or to, or to social issues that have only be, become more pronounced, has, has maybe influenced in, in literature or, or in film some of the works that have happened since? Or do you, or do you see some similar kind of stories or um, the cinematic kind of tropes that, that maybe draw from, from the book directly or not um, in, in your other work? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I mean, I think it comes in a tradition of other. I haven't mentioned, for example, a Guinea film from 1994 called uh, um, um, Ballon d'Or, Golden Ball. It's about this young boy Bandian who actually ends up going uh, to where the, the same city, Strasbourg, where Sally resides in this novel. 
um, and he's only a, a, an 11 year old that gets, uh, they get uh, uh, scouted and moved to the big leads, but it's a lighthearted film. Uh, and we don't know if he's going to make it. We only see his, his trajectory before he actually makes it to, so it stops, it stops at the beginning of the fantasy, but he's, he's, he's in France. So this novel comes a few years later. And then, as you said, I actually, one of the things that I like about this novel is that it feels timeless, which is both, it, it's great for us as teachers, but it's very unfortunate for the realities that you just described, because some of these things are very much so cyclical and they keep happening, right? So, uh, you know, I've, I've had several conversations with my, my students about uh, Didier Drogba or uh, Samuel Leto and, you know, some of these major figures and what they're calling for and the expectations that are being put on them to give back to the country, return to the country, create clubs of the country, invest in the infrastructure. And that hasn't happen yet and it's not you know necessarily the responsibility of 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 of, uh, of, of just uh, of just a few but i i think this is very much so a story that defines the post-colonial even right now the musa Touré's film 2012 it's about it's about the same it's about the same thing it's about the attempt to you know traverse the atlantic in order to make it as a some of the characters as a football player in uh, in spain and in, in that particular case um, uh, as recent as 2019, and again, I'm picking film examples because that's kind of what I, that's, that's obviously what I do, but Atlantics by, uh, by Mati Diop is the latest example that even 20 years into the 21st century, we have the fantasy of the return, right? I don't mean to ruin it if people haven't seen it, but it's a number of young men decide to go to, to by boat to, uh, to France and they disappear and we don't know what happened. That's why I won't say what happens, but they, they, some, their spirits come back in, you know, uh, in the bodies of, uh, of their loved ones. And that is also a sort of post-colonial, uh, a continuation of the post-colonial fantasy is just wrapped, doesn't have necessarily the soccer attached to it, but it's the same story. Um, I think there's one more comment that I was going to make, uh, so I, I, you know, I don't know if Fatou Diom's novel has had an influence on all these films that came up, came out in, you know, later in the 21st century, as much as this is one of the major topics in post-colonial West African cinema and literature, and to various degrees, writers and filmmakers keep going back to this story. Uh, it's the story that really defines the second part of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. I was gonna make a point about one example that we've had recently about, you know, European clubs kind of looking down on the African Cups of Nation and by European clubs, I mean certain managers. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I actually, it's even perhaps you're a Liverpool fan. I have no idea, but like, you know, club, club had, club, club had uh, you know, sort of a dismissive comment about the, African Cup of Nations, and then he took it back and it was fine. Like, I, I don't think he, I personally don't think he meant anything, you know, nefarious or whatever, but it's the, that kind of reality of like how people on the European continent look down on like the importance of an act of the African Nations Cup, which is a crucial, crucial event for many, many African nations, right? And even failing to understand the magnitude of that club is indicative of how this, this problem continues and it will then reverberate into representations of, you know, filmic representations or, or novelistic representations. Um, yeah, a little bit of a convoluted response, but yeah, I don't, I, I think, it's kind of a bridge 2003 happening right at the turn of the century, but it really connects 40 years of literature and, and, and cinema to what's happening now and with, with various, very small, subtle changes, but it's still there very much so. Yeah, I can think of the novel as a bridge of sorts between the previous century and, and the next.
Uh -huh. um, it, it's funny, your, your comments at the end there, Vlad, um, anticipate, I don't think you'd seen this, but in the chat, um, someone had just posed the question, Shashank had written, a lot of people in Europe complain about international breaks and tournaments that occur during the European club calendar, in, such as the African Cup of Nations. Is, is that a, a theme that you see in some of the films and literature, that, um, uh, including Belly of the Atlantic, this sort of Eurocentricism and that kind of a tension between, um, um, you know, uh, uh, the elevation, the, the elevation of the, ga the game in, in Europe, and, and and the sort of wider political implications of that versus in Africa. And it sounds like that that is something that yeah. that is maybe in the background of this wider body of work that you're interested in. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh... I will point out that I think Sedona has a question. We're not going to forget you, or we're going to come back to that. Uh, but it is a question that really uh, flows from my from my previous answer. So I'll move to that. Uh, the short answer is that uh, yes, it is a Eurocentric tension and Eurocentrism, one hundred percent. But it is not explored in my book, and the reason is, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, you know, the once you put a, put a book out there and has the in the title the word football, everybody thinks you're suddenly a you know you're a, you're an expert on football. I am actually a film specialist masquerading as a football specialist. So I've used football as a sort of springboard into. Uh, the point of that that book is making down the eventually is uh, when what I'm interested in is about sort of this the creation of a material physical body of cinema that film itself has a skin uh, whether it's through sound or through the image actually so that's what I was building up towards but I will say that where I deal with something similar is in the way um, Europeans and Americans have talked about African cinema by way of European and American cinema. So in that way, I can see, I've always seen a parallel in the way uh, uh, the game was brought to the continent early, 20, you know, late 19th century into 20th century as a way to sort of control the masses, right? The French and the English and the, the Dutch and the Germans all did this. But then because of the nature of the game is such a democratic um, uh, uh, sport, it ended up, creating these very tightly knit communities all over Africa that then uh, created grassroots movements that ended up being uh, oppositional forces to colonialism itself. So it backfired. And in a similar way, film when in around 19, 1960s, when it kind of started, uh, it, 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 that that history is uh, debatable in, uh, in, in West Africa. Initially, everything that one could discuss was, well, you know, influences from Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut and all those like major uh, French new waivers uh, who were making films in France at the time. Um, but Ousmane Semben and all these uh, fantastic directors, Mambetti, are uh, auteurs in their own right. Uh, there's a famous, um, I was very happy to, I, I will very rarely use the words happy and Twitter in the same sentence, but I was very happy to see on Twitter last week uh, that uh, a, a snippet from a Sam Ben interview is making the rounds again. And in that snippet, he, you know, he's being asked, uh, you know, like, what do Europeans think about his films? And he says, I don't care. Like, you know, I'm not making films for Europeans. They should care about, uh, you know, like, I, I am the sun and everything basically saying, I am the sun and the world revolves around me. So uh, I don't care what the, what, the, what the Europeans think about my movies or uh, if they even see them. So it's a, um, uh, again, sp speaking of, to my point earlier about moving from global south to the global north rather than the other way around. So yes, all that to say that, again, I'm using football as a prop of sorts. Uh, and also I do have an interest um, personally, I would say that um, the greatest tragedy, and I'm very lucky, uh, take this with a grain of salt, the greatest trauma of my life is uh, Romania losing in the quarterfinals at the penalty kicks, you know, in 1994 at the World Cup in the United States. I was uh, 15 at the time, and and it it it, uh, it it haunts me to this day. I know I'm wearing actually yeah, yellow today, but I usually have a like a reaction to the Swedish yellow uh, jersey. And I wanted to sort of figure out like, why is it, why do I care so much about this? I saw it's such an irrational thing, you know, to like care about it, you know, 25 years later, um, 27 even. Um, and uh, that's kind of was the impetus, but it was not, it was never really a book about football. It was a, a book about, about cinema by way of football and representations of football. 
So, um, and Sedona's question, Stephen, if I may just go to it, uh, she's asking about the overall theme here. Uh, I, I, if I had to pick one, it would have to be identity. My students uh, definitely felt that that is the one that uh, drives the story forward. The shifting identity of the immigrant, Sally, who was, who we get to know who she was in flashbacks uh, after getting to know her as an immigrant, and then we have to project into the future of who she might become. So this shifting uh, type of identity, which kind of defines uh, also the, the post-colonial condition, the, the movie that I mentioned before, La Pirog, there is an extended scene in which the pirogue loses its, uh, its uh, engine and it's just drifting on the, on the Atlantic. And that's another beautiful metaphor for this sort of like drifting uh, identity condition of the, of the immigrant. Uh, Madike also, who seems so set in his ways and it's like, I know what my identity is. And it just has like a sudden change of heart. And then there are all these characters whose identities are connected to the Atlantic, to the island, to immigration, to other people around them. So of all of them, I think, you know, uh, memory, alienation, all those feed into this large theme of, of identity, which is quintessential for post-colonial studies. Yeah. That's great. Um, thank you so much for those thoughtful responses, Vlad. I see that we are almost at time, and I know that that you've got yet more appointments uh, to get to next. And I know that you've been speaking for <laughs> probably nigh on three hours now. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up here. I want to thank our, um, our sponsors and co-sponsors for today, particularly the Department of African Cultural Studies. Um, thank you to everyone who's who's able to uh, attend this this event. I hope to see it the um, future events as well, particularly in this in this series as we get ready for the big kickoff on November the twentieth. And most of all, I want to thank Vlad for being our, our speaker today and and for speaking uh, really uh, insightfully uh, about this this novel that um, I'm sure many of us will now uh, want to read and and think through ourselves. So thank you so much, Vlad. Thank you, thank you for having me. I see Ava, Ava was one of my students. There you go, she just said thank you. So it's good to, good to see you. There you go, I see you.